You're gonna be much longer because I'm doing a video. Come on, dear, it'll be okay. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We've gone on location. We're here at 30 Fordham Drive, the location of the Temple of Music where President William McKinley was assassinated on September 6, 1901. So let's tell you the story, let's give you the facts, let's grow your brain, giddy up for the learning. So a little bit about President William McKinley. President William McKinley, the last president to serve in the Civil War, first served in the House of Representatives, and he was a big pusher of protective tariffs. He's an isolationist. And then the Panic of 1893, and that put him out of office. He served a little bit of time as governor of Ohio, and then bada boom, bada bing, 1896, he woofs out William Jennings Bryan and becomes president in the midst of economic recession. And boy, does he have a good four years. Not only does the economy boom, but so do the guns. Spanish-American war baby. So by the time 1900 rolls around, it looks like he's a shoe in And by 1900, our boy takes the presidency looking for four more years of prosperity. And it's only September 1901. He's only been in his second term for four or five months before he's gonna die. Now, Leon Cholgos, he's a different story. The Panic of 1893 didn't do as good for him as it did for McKinley. In fact, in Cleveland, uh, Cholgos was a factory worker. And the Panic of 1893, when they lowered his wages, he went on strike. And you know what happened to guys who went on strike back then? They got fired. Now, there's a lot of different theories about Cholgos and his mental state, but we do know that he kind of drifted around between Cleveland, Chicago, a little bit of time in Buffalo, but we do know that he became attracted to socialism. And when socialism didn't do it for him, he drifted even farther and he went towards anarchism. So let's set the scene in Buffalo a little bit. You really have to kind of figure in Niagara Falls because you have to remember at the turn of the century, Buffalo, New York is gonna be the city of lights. We're gonna get our energy from Niagara Falls. And in 1901, the Pan American Exposition's gonna show it off. And that's why McKinley is coming. And there's also some political reasons. You have to remember that William McKinley was a huge advocate in his first term of protective tariffs. And we do know, maybe it's the Spanish-American War and foreign markets, that he wants to shift gears. So he's coming to Buffalo to shake some hands, maybe to go on a couple rides, but more importantly, to push his new economic theories of free trade. He's backing away from isolationism. He's moving away from tariffs. So on September 4th, his train arrives. Now, Leon Cholgos had been in Buffalo about a week at that point. He came to Buffalo for the concise act of murdering the president. On September 3rd, he bought his gun. He was even at the train station when McKinley showed up on September 4th. And a funny story is, as soon as McKinley's train arrived, it seems that one of the cannons misfired, and everybody thought that it was a bomb, and people started screaming, Anarchist! And Leon Cholskos was just trying to get a little bit closer to get that shot off, but didn't, it didn't occur on that day. So, the next day, on September 5th, uh, McKinley shows up at the fair. 50,000 people watched him deliver his speech on free trade. He got tremendous feedback and applause. And then on the next day, the fateful day of September 6th, he spent his morning going to Niagara Falls for a little bit of a tour with his wife. And when he got back around 3.30, he's going to do what every politician loves to do, shake some hands. <laughs> Let's set the stage. He's come back from Niagara Falls and he's doing what politicians do best. He's gonna shake hands. And he was warned, he was warned by his personal secretary two or three times how dangerous it was to shake hands in an open auditorium like this. Even though you can see it's nowhere here anymore. They took those buildings down after the exposition. But it's a 10 minute gig, 10 minutes of shaking hands. So Leon's waiting to get his chance to shoot the president. A few minutes before he comes in, he's in line waiting all day. The little girl asks McKinley for his lucky red carnation. And what does McKinley do? He gives it to her. A few minutes later, Leon comes in and he had the gun, a 37 revolver, wrapped in a towel and he made it look like it was kind of like a sweat towel. And under normal circumstances, they probably would have asked to see his hands, but it was so hot, nobody thought any different. 
And then when Leon reached out his hand to shake the president, the other hand fired. <laughs> one of the shots hit McKinley's uh, button on his shirt, kind of grazed him a little bit, and the other one landed deep in his abdomen, never to be found again. What's interesting is as McKinley slumped back and he was kind of grabbed by the people around him, needless to say, he's got a bullet in his belly. So what's going to happen? McKinley is rushed off to the Expeditions Hospital. We are, interestingly enough, there is an available x-ray machine. There's an x-ray machine on premise, but people are too scared to use it. One of Edison's new creatures of the night. So what happens? Now, at that time period, most people believed that if you got a bullet wound to the belly, you were going to get gangrene and die. But what most people don't know was that there were renowned surgeons in the area that already had experience removing these types of wounds. In fact, Dr. Roswell Park is operating on a neck patient in Niagara Falls, and when someone runs in and says, we have an emergency, we need you in Buffalo, he says, I can't leave a patient for anybody, even the President of the United States, and it was the President of the United States. So what happens? It's kind of a doctor without the best skills in the world. They're actually using refracted light to shine onto the patient. What's kind of ironic is, is that here is the Festival of Lights, and they're using mirrors to pour sunshine into the open wound of the obese dying president. So what happens? He sews them up, baby. Black nylon thread. It's not gonna work out. Most people immediately thought the president was gonna die, and then when he didn't die after a few days, Teddy Roosevelt um, actually came right away. Everybody thought McKinley was recovering. Um, Roosevelt left to go shoot bears in the Adirondacks. That's how uh, well McKinley was doing. He even started to have a little hot soup. But it's not going to work out because the gangrene is festering. And on September 14th, the president's going to die about 2.30 in the morning. Um, Roosevelt's going to be sworn in the next day. He's rushed in from the Adirondacks. And we now have the progressive movement. I can't emphasize enough how this event changes the course of American history. This really does bring us from the industrial age to the progressive age. Many people don't know this, but one of the reasons Roosevelt was vice president was he was governor of New York, and a lot of the political bosses of New York, the Republican bosses, didn't like this guy snooping around and kind of investigating corruption. So they thought the vice president was a nice place for to put him on ice, and now he's going to be the president. Now, immediately, obviously, we have Leon Cholgos in custody, and a lot of America, and especially the federal government, wanted to go after the anarchists. They thought the anarchists were behind us. And in fact, Leon had spent some time with Emma Goldman, the famous American anarchist, um, actually riding in a car to the train station in Chicago with her once. Um, but uh, even the anarchists were suspect of Leon. They actually put in one of their papers kind of a warning. They thought that he was a spy. Emma Goldman spent three weeks in jail as they investigated the anarchists, but they couldn't find any connection. So at the trial that lasted one day, I don't think he got the best defense. Not only was Leon suffering um, from a respiratory disease, but there are many indicators that he had deep mental issues, and he was probably suffering from a mental disease. But it doesn't matter, because about a half hour the jury's going to take to render their guilty verdict and their death sentence. Now today, when you get the death penalty, you do like 10 years hanging out. Leanne's going to be dead um, about a month later, October 29th, in New York's electric chair. So there you go, guys. There's a little bit of the learning on the YouTubes. McKinley's assassination. We hope that you enjoyed the lesson, and we certainly hope that you check out Hip Hughes online and subscribe, because it's the right thing to do. We have hundreds of videos. What are you waiting for? And you know what I'm going to say, because I say it every time. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time on Hip Hughes. What? What do you want? I was just getting tired of waiting. I guess my time's up. <laughs>